Andre Loren Benjamin was born May 27, 1975, in Atlanta, Georgia. Andre was born to uh, Sharon Benjamin and Lawrence Walker. Andre was the only child. When he was a baby, he was unusual. He wasn't a crying baby. He was a hungry baby. He was a little dog. He really was. You can tell that it was something about that, that young boy. The things that babies play with, he wouldn't play with. You just put him on the blanket, give him some newspaper, and he'll just take the paper, and he'll just crumble it. He loved the sound. After Andre was born, Sherry and I moved to the apartment. Dre's parents never actually got married. Andre's father, Lawrence, and I moved in together to try and really make the relationship work. We lived together for about two or three months. Well, at that time, you know, I was just wild. We do stupid things when we young. Those were not good times. The father is still into his dating scene. I admit it. I mean, I was, uh, I just, I was fooling around with another woman. He politely brought one of his attractions to the apartment and says, okay, the only reason I'm with you is because of the baby. And that's when I said, okay, the writing on the wall, it's time for you to get out of here. I moved out and I didn't look back. I moved into an apartment and I didn't have any furniture. I had $450, and I only could buy a mattress set. So Andre and I ate, slept, and entertained on that one mattress. Everything that Sharon had to endure during that period was a struggle. We moved around a lot of times because I didn't have the rent money. And when you get these notices on the door, it says either you pay or you move. I go to the apartment complex one day, and knock on the door and hear this hollow sound. He was always prepared. Dre, let's go. I'm ready, Ma. They had settled down in an uh, apartment complex uh, across from Born Home, which is like the epitome of projects here in, in Atlanta, Georgia. The kids in the neighborhood, nine times out of ten, they were on their way to being drug dealers or pimps or gangbangers. You're looking out a window and people fighting and the fire engines, and you knew that there was something better for your child. So it only made sense to bus Andre to the part of town where he could be exposed to something finer. During the 80s, you know, the Atlanta public school system participated in this minority to majority program to integrate the schools, racially integrate the schools. They take kids from one area and bus them to another, and I said, wow, the grass is greener over there. Andre was bused to Sarah Smith Elementary School and Sutton Middle School in Buckhead, which is a, the white side of town. We're riding into predominantly white neighborhoods, affluent white neighborhoods, two, three, four hundred thousand dollar homes. He's seen middle class people walk down the street with briefcases. He's seen Lamborghinis. He's seen Ferraris. It was a very suburban storybook sort of setting, you know, a long way from where we grew up. You know, there is grass on the, on the ground in, the, in the, at these houses. So it was, it was like night and day. I think it was a big culture shock for Andre. Just like different types of people, we went to school with the real Ferris Bueller. One, two, three. Well, those kids wore polo, and they did things differently. They were skateboarding, and the wind and the skater die stuff, so just hanging with different folks, it's going to rub off on you. When Dre was 13, he got into fashion. Andre wanted to buy, you know, all these name brand clothes, and I couldn't afford it. So he'll take plain white shirts that he might dye himself, and he'll actually put his own logos on his shirt. His dress definitely changed. He started seeing more of the preppy look, the sweater behind your neck, colored pants, like green pants. When he came back to the neighborhood, people around him was like, what the hell you got on? Being in that sort of racially mixed environment, Andre he got a lot of exposure to music that I think a lot of the kids in our neighborhoods didn't get. No rock music or that pop synthesized music. And he always he'd be rocking with his headset to ZZ Top. Anything from Madonna to Sting to Duran Duran. I think he learned that there's a different side of the world. It opened the horizon of his knowledge, of his insight. He always thought outside the box. My grandma had a record player, and we'll play a record, we'll sing to it. If it doesn't sound good, Dre will say, well, nah, that ain't the way that sound. And he'll go to the back, and he'll twist some wires around and take it apart. He'll just do stuff till it sounds right to him. 
if he'd heard the sound of an instrument or a record, he wanted to see where that sound was coming from. No matter how much you told him no, he was always one to see what's behind that door. Yeah. Andre began to rebel as he was transitioning from middle to high school. He adopted the slogan that rules can be broken. He began to get wild. He just would do thuggish things. You know, those things that you got bust out of the neighborhood so you didn't do. Kicking over mailboxes. Putting some kind of little cape over on a teacher. Or just being wild, man. His grades start slipping in school. He started coming to home with new clothes and mom knows she didn't buy them. They used to go to London Mat and steal clothes. He needed to be straightened out. Mom was strict. You know, she was cool, but she was strict, too. She didn't play no games. If you don't do what Sharon says, then uh, you get yourself in some trouble. He wanted to hang out on the corner in the neighborhood with the guys, which I'm like, oh, no. I could just see it got on his nerves, you know, how stern she was. He was like, man, I got to get out. He felt like, I don't have to answer to you. I'm a teenager now, so I'm going to do what I want to do. It had gotten to a point where he wasn't afraid of Sharon's trouble. It was time for a man to speak. Andre went to live with his father when he was 16. Lawrence took Dre in because I think finally he said, OK, this is the time for me to really be a father now. He needed some male balance. He really did because he was up on his mom. He needs some direction. Sharon was very apprehensive. She didn't want him to go. That was her baby. I was scared to let Andre go. I thought that it was going to be a, a, a high risk because I didn't know if Lawrence was ready to raise Andre, but it was time for him to know his father. Next, Andre continues to call the shots. He's hanging out late at night, going to clubs, and I'm like, what is going on? Andre's rebelling probably had a lot to do with the music. Then, he meets his match. Andre and Antoine, they were rival MCs battling each other. They really didn't like each other when they first met. It's about his music. He decided, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a rapper. Dre be up nice writing. And if there's no paper to write down a lyric, he would write it on the wall, on tall tissue, or whatever he had to write it on. Andre was eating, sleeping, and just living rap. He went to Tri-Cities in East Point. Tri-Cities High School is a school of the performing arts. That's when he met Antoine Patton. Antoine Big Boy Patton was born February 1st, 1975 in Savannah, Georgia. He was the firstborn of the five kids that I have. I was really young when I had Antoine. Our parents, Rowena Patton and Tony Cures, met in Savannah at Jenkins High School. I was 15, and he was like 18 at the time. And our mother got pregnant with Antoine. When Antoine was very little, our father went out to the military. Once he's in the military, that was it. You know, he was just going from, you know, one place to another. It just got to the point where Verena decided it's just going to be me and my kid. So the extended family played a big role in him growing up. The Patton family is a very large family. <laughs> Everybody was real close-knit. Our family just didn't have that much money to say, hey, you know, we have our own places. It was all of us living in the house together. It was maybe 50 people in a three-bedroom, tiny house. As kids, man, we had it rough. We had to alternate shoes, <laughs> got Nikes, we all had to share. And the same Halloween hat year after year, we made the best out of a bad situation. <laughs> Antoine didn't want to have to ask for money. He wanted to be able to say, well, I have my own. We would throw candy parties and charge kids to come in and actually eat candy all day. And he was the DJ, play music. And I mean, I'm telling you, we we're eight, nine, ten years old with a house full of kids. He was an entrepreneur. He knew ways to get what he wanted, you know, and he wasn't afraid to work it. He was a young, amusing kid. 
because he developed a lot of personality with being around a lot of adults. He'd go off, you know, for the weekend to go kick it with his uncles over at Fraser Homes. It was like one of the no notorious projects in Savannah. We seen a little bit of everything going on there. Shootings, killings, drugs, everything. He spent a lot of time in Fraser Homes, and what he was doing over there, I have no idea. But I knew he, he was coming back with money. He was, you know, brought up around the drug scene at an early age. He definitely had an experience with that dark side. Antoine went to middle school at the Wren Middle School in Savannah, Georgia. He always had thousands and thousands of friends, black, white, green, purple, whatever. He liked school and he did well in it. Teachers loved him. He was always a smart kid, straight A student. He just had that thing. It just clicked to him. In the middle school days, Antoine listened to every type of music you could think of. From hip hop to eclectic pop, he was really, really into Kate Bush. You just wouldn't expect normal little black kids to be listening to it. Kate Bush. Everybody else thought he was crazy. Antoine was really getting into rapping during that time. He would hear, you know, Tribe Called Quest. Yo, boy, advice. All the time, Tip. And I guess getting inspired to write. So then grab the microphone and let your words rip. He used to write rhymes all the time, and he always had the pen and the pad wherever he went. So he started, like, really, like, just studying the music. Every summer, he came up to Atlanta where everything was about music. Welcome to Atlanta where the play is played. Our Aunt Renee moved to Atlanta and was thriving and doing well. Just to go stay with her in the summertime, that was better than going to Disney World. Savannah was really much slower than Atlanta, so therefore, he saw a lot of opportunity. He was like, okay, Atlanta is the place I need to be. Renee used to be a singer. Back in the early 70s, she had belonged to a band over in Tokyo, and they called her Lil Aretha. Renee, you know, knew music and actually kind of geared him into music. Aunt Renee was a second mom to Antoine. She set rules for him, you know, and she believed in him. At 15, Antoine talked her into letting him stay in Atlanta to graduate high school to pursue a career in music. He had to stay out of trouble, had to abide by her rules. He had to make sure his school was kept up. Antoine started Tri-City High School in 10th grade. Tri-Cities High School is the home of the Visual and Performing Arts Magnet Program. It was like fame without people dancing on the tables. Everybody was rapping and singing at the school. As long as they're learning, we let the kids be creative. <laughs> Antoine did a video as part of the video club. He did a rap, and it was so good that it was entered into a contest. He was real proud of that, because he bought the tape home and showed my mom, like, man, look, that's, that's me. Look, that's me. That's me. That's when the music became real serious and took you from, I just love music and I want to be a rapper, to I'm going to be a rapper. That's when we met Dre. The cafeteria was a place where a lot of people would gather and bust out singing or rapping or freestyling against each other. Andre and Antoine, they were rival MCs battling each other in these lunchroom rap battles. The battling was going back and forth. They really didn't like each other when they first met. Antoine being the more street-wise, more flamboyant one, his rhymes were more confrontational. I'm just a southern playlistic pimp. I used to slang a fat rock, but now I'm serving him. Whereas Dre's were more observatory. Andre would rap about things that he felt. Should I answer the call? Yes, we making them all. We met him off in the mall. Recall players ball. They became like the elitists of the Tri-Cities hip-hop community. They was like, wow, you got a nice rap. You got a nice rap. Both of them like rapping and 
they were just really good at it together. They liked each other's styles, and you know, and wanted to hook up together, so they connected. Next, Dre and Tuan fight to be heard. And they would perform at the local Texaco down the street. They didn't care. As long as they thought somebody was going to see them rap, they was going to perform. Then their dream falls apart. Here's a person who can put you in position to be a professional rapper. And he tell you you're not good enough. Log on to VH1.com to see rare photos and footage of OutKast. And check out early photos and footage of all Driven artists. Dre and Twan met at Tri-Cities. They both were really starting, you know, to get into rap. I remember when he told me about Dre, I met this dude. We, like, just bonded and connected like brothers. Take this for example, young brothers want rap. Cause they became best of friends. They were spending a lot of time writing, rapping, rehearsing, getting their image together. They had an idea together. We can do this. Let's practice and come up with ways that we can get our rhymes heard. So they was like, OK, let's form a group. The first name that Antoine and Andre picked was Two Shades Deep. They felt like there was two brothers of color deep in the same Their names was Black Dog and Black Wolf. Their little sign was like a little paw print. They were trying to get a little exposure inside the Atlanta area. And they would perform at the local Texaco down the street. They didn't care. As long as they thought somebody was going to see them rap, they was going to perform. At that point, they were looking for anybody who said they were connected with music. They met Rico way their senior year. I was working at a beauty supply store in East Point, Georgia. Rico was pretty much the head producer, or like the mouthpiece of Organized Noise. Make the music that the people can't ignore. Organized Noise Productions is myself, Rico Wade. It's my partner, Sleepy Brown, and the founder, the brainchild, Ray Murray. We're stepping out. We had a little reputation for producing hip-hop in Atlanta. Rico and I were having a conversation. I said, man, I wish we had two young dudes. I'm talking about, like, two fly high school cats to come. We'd be straight. As I said that, these two guys came walking over the hill. When they came, we were standing out in front of the store, and we were just chilling for a minute. And Rico was like, well, what, what can y'all do? They rapped over this song, man. I swear they rapped for about 10 minutes piece with no breaks. It just started flowing and freestyling back and forth. Ain't no one better. And when I'm on the microphone, you best to wear your sweater. Cause the maker of the piece of my pie. Now break a break a tin phone. Can I get some reply? It'd be back and forth until he's like, okay, you guys can rap. I was totally amazed. So I instantly was like, yo, I want to take y'all to the dungeon. Oh, that's what we do on um, music. The dungeon was where organized noise called home. The dungeon was my mother's basement. It was an unfinished basement. My old brick house in Atlanta, Georgia. And the dungeon really was a dungeon. It was a basement made out of red clay. It was just dirt. You might have cobwebs. You might actually see rats running on top of the red dirt. It was eerie. You go down there, we got all the equipment set up. It's like green lights. You see guys just rapping and going at it. They would kind of be vibing. They all be bobbing their heads to that same beat. That's where we'll come, freestyle, come and, and write raps, listen to music, vibe, just stay out of jail and out of trouble, you know? When Antoine and Andre first came to the dungeon, they immediately kind of fell in love. The dungeon family was really tight. We just all stuck together. Everybody fed off each other. This was where the people who love to do what you do were. It was a working environment. All we did was do music. We just go down there and sleep in sleeping bags on the floor and wake up to the music, get right back to the vibe. We knew that eventually one of us was going to be big musically. Antoine and Andre, they were spending like all that time at the dungeon. They were spending every moment of every day. They just latched on to it and they didn't want to leave. Like, you know what I mean? Antoine and Andre, they would skip school to come over to the dungeon and work on songs. These were kids who just said, I'm going to stay here. I'm not going to school tomorrow. I'm not going to do what my mother and my father say or my auntie say. You know what I mean? I want to do this. Renee was furious. Antoine wasn't calling. He wasn't checking in like he was supposed to. And the grades were slipping. He wasn't keeping his part of the deal up. She threatened to send him back to Savannah. And he was terrified. <laughs> Because he didn't want to come home. Because he know he had worked so hard for what he was trying to do. Juan is a mastermind, you know. He figured out how to get grades, do the work, go to school, and then go to the dungeon with Dre. 
I found out Andre wasn't attending school. Dre dropped out of school. Antoine and Andre were so serious about rapping, they was not going to let anything or anybody stand in their way. Two Shades Deep wasn't fitting them anymore. They just went through the dictionary, tried to just find a word that best described them, and they came up with outcast. Outcast, pronounced outcast. An adjective meaning homeless or unaccepted in society. Well, we was trying to think of a word, you know what I'm saying, to describe us as the people, you know what I'm saying, and that's, that's daily, every day, outcast. Since you're born, you're outcast. We all outcasts in the sense of we left everything that we had to pursue our dreams. We different. We're not going to be the regular or the normal. The word outcast personified the vibe. And once the name was officially changed to outcast, that's when Antoine changed his name to Big Boy. Like anything Twan did, Twan did it big. You call him Big Boy because his attitude was big. You know what I'm saying? We're going to maneuver this thing on down the strip. Yeah, y'all got Big Dre in the house, you know what I'm saying? And you're getting blizzard with the one and only Big Boy, and we the outcast. And we gonna represent Atlanta like that. They was the vehicle, and Reed was trying to get them to do a show for L.A. Reed. I had a relationship with L.A. Reed, who was the president of the Face Records. The Face at the time was an R&B label. You had Usher, TLC, Tony Braxton. L.A. Reid was an R&B and pop producer. He hadn't ever worked with a rap group before. We were banking on L.A. Reid. That's the only real connect we had. The first time I met Antoine and Andre, they came in to my office, and they stood three feet from my desk, and they performed for me. And the guys just was rapping, going back and forth. Just the international player coming, coming through your stereo. Put the dodge danger, I'm taking it one day. At a time, I got the fattest dimes around my way. L.A. pulled us to the side and said, I love your music, but you need stars. These guys are good, but I don't know if they're stars. They didn't understand what was different about them. They looked like a rap group. They sounded like a rap group, but hadn't quite found their musical identity. I thought the music was good. I thought their rhyming was good. The writing was good. Wasn't convinced on the star side. Here's a person who could put you in a position to be a professional rapper. He tell you you're not good enough. They were most definitely disillusioned and they were confused. Andre, of course, was even more down because he wasn't going to school. Dre had dropped out of school. He was mainly relying on the music. And when that happened, you know, boy, he took it hard. They're starting to lose their confidence now. They were starting to believe that maybe they weren't supposed to be rapping. Maybe they were supposed to go to college. Or maybe they were supposed to go to the military. I remember that was just really painful to Big Boy. But he jumped up and he kept going at it. Big Boy was like, look, let's just keep going. Let's see what it is L.A. Reid's trying to get, because he's our only outlet right now. Organized Noise began to work with them and really start to get them to actually become artists. There was a whole military-type mind frame that I had in cats going on. Like, yeah. We made them run around the block saying their rhymes so they could keep their wind up, so that they could say the rhymes on stage and perform moves and not be out of breath. It was like drill school, trying to get them on point together. We used to have rap-offs, like, I'd do a beat, and everybody would sit there and rap. It wasn't just, uh, you know, Brady Bunch now. We used to, like, go off on each other. We were like, man, you got to be better than this person. We were on them guys like, that is whack. Write it again. We made them put substance into the lyricism, into the rhyme. Like, it's got to have weight to it. It's got to have more truth than fantasy and myth. They learn how to be writers, and they learn, you know, the art behind, you know, rap music. Organized was molding them into real artists. We were to them the three mad scientists that were putting together this Frankenstein two-headed monster. Rico Wade called me, and all I know is he kept saying, outcast, outcast, outcast. At that point, I was trying to get him to be as excited about Outkast as I was. Reek was just like on him so much, like, yo, these cats dope, they dope, they dope. I said, okay, cool, bring them in. We went back and just came back harder. <laughs> By the second showcase, we had improved the music, we improved the demo, but we also improved the staging. <laughs> second audition was more full-blown. People there, everybody was loving them. They were 
really being themselves. It blew L.A. away, because he was like, okay, now that's something. Okay, now I, I get it. It was unique. There was nothing else like it. Didn't sound like New York. Didn't sound like L.A. Didn't sound like anything that I'd heard before. He was like, I need to sign this group. That was the night I decided, okay, got to do this. Outcasts had done several showcases for L.A. Reid, and the last one finally won them over. I thought they were amazing. And so we went on and made an arrangement to sign them. Oh, they was ecstatic. Yeah, we gonna keep going. After Outcast was signed, L.A. Reid calls us. He's like, we got a Christmas album, and then we think this is an opportunity to introduce Outkast. They was like, man, we don't wanna do no Christmas song. A Christmas song. Dre reaction was, man, what the hell are we gonna talk about? We some rappers, man. Like, rappers don't be talking about Christmas. It's beginning to look a lot like wood. Follow my every step. Take Growing up in the hood, we couldn't talk about Christmas in the American sense. Cause I'm a player doing what the players do. We had to make a song that was equivalent to us. It was called Players Ball. And it was basically talking about, you know, how there barely is a Christmas in the ghetto. We basically saying that this is what we do every day. We never change because of a holiday. I heard the song and I said, oh my God, this is amazing. We need an album. Towards the end of 1993, they went in the studio and started to record. We stayed in that studio at least two months every day. Outcast wouldn't even leave the studio some nights. They would sleep on the floors. That's how hard they worked to make this record a success. Our main purpose and goal was to show the world that the South had something to say. Southern Playalistic Cadillac Music was released April 26, 1994. At the time, rap was all East Coast and West Coast. It was really no in-between. This was the birth of Southern hip hop. It was critically acclaimed. We got a lot of respect. Seven to eight hundred thousand records sold. They took over Atlanta almost immediately. There was no way you couldn't hear about Outkast. Big and Dre were on cloud nine at that time. They were teenagers. They were young and they were rowdy. Hold up. Drinking, smoking, partying the girls. Big and Dre were really living large. Around this time, Big Boy met Shalita. It was love at first sight. They were together quite a bit, but I really didn't know the depths of the relationship until I found out he had a kid that was on the way. Twan had his first child, Jordan Patton, March 31st, 1995. Big Boy was so excited about becoming a father. Fatherhood for Antoine was a really big deal since, you know, his dad wasn't there most of the time for him. He was going to make sure that he's going to be there for his child. After Jordan was born, he didn't stop partying, but he was always there for the responsibilities of being a father. He took those very seriously. No matter what he did the night before, he was trying to get home to cook breakfast for Jordan. Twine was looking further into the future. I have to get back in the studio. Outkast began recording their second album, Mate the Aliens, around 1995. They really started to come into their own as artists and producers on Mate the Aliens. And they really became men who understood their craft and mastered their craft. Everybody let me get say, oh, yeah, girl. And they stepped up and their confidence was starting to grow. Things were really looking up. And then the news about Renee. The big boy son, Renee, became ill. I was thinking it was one of those things where she'd be all right in the next couple of days. As his aunt was almost like his mom, in a sense. She helped to raise him, and he was extremely close to her. We were all surprised and, and definitely taken aback by it progressing and becoming worse. I was on my way to the hospital, and Antoine said, well, you don't have to go. I said, well, why not? And that's when he told me. That she had uh, passed. She died of pneumonia. Yeah, fluids in the lungs, that type thing, yeah. I think that was like the first time he actually called her mom. It's like, you know, my mom is gone. And it, it was just a huge blow for him. 
and for everyone else. At times, you know, he would just, you know, break down. You know, just thinking about it, it was, it was unbearable. I think he coped with her death through writing. Yeah, I remember the song Babylon, where he had the verse about Renee, and the motion of him rapping. You could just, you could just, you could just feel it. People don't know the stress I'm dealing with day to day. day. Speaking about the feelings I'm possessing for Renee. When Renee died, that was a really tough time for Big Boy. Andre absolutely stood by him and helped to kind of pull him up along and re-motivate him to really put Outkast out there and make them as big as possible. ATL was released August 27, 1996. ATL is a total metamorphosis album. On the first album, you probably thought that the group was inseparable and their image was pretty much the same. On ATL, Dre started going in a different direction. He didn't want to be a pimp. He didn't want to be a player. That was Big Boy's vibe. Big Boy really embellished it. Dre was just more in between. So that's when he went through the transition of really, really trying to find himself. Andre felt like he had to change his life. A lot of things that he was doing, he said that he didn't want to do them anymore. He stopped drinking, he stopped eating meat, he stopped smoking. He grew his hair, you know, he got into books and spiritualism. Even went as far as to practice celibacy for about a year. He found some kind of clarity, and he decided he was going to show who he was and not be made into anything. I still remember, like, one day he was jeans and T-shirt and a fresh, fresh pair of sneakers on, and then, bam, he's in the turban. And it was actually a hat that you get from the beauty supply store. You know, they look, grandmama has that you wear in church. Dre walks out with a turban on, and everybody's looking like, man, what in the hell is Dre doing? What does he have on? And the next second, you're going out to the mall, and everybody got on turbans. Dre was taking a risk with the wardrobe. He was doing a vegan thing, and he happened to meet a girl that was into the same thing. He met Erica Badu at a club in New York. Oh. Erica Badu was a soul singer that just burst onto the music scene. Erica was bohemian, she was intelligent, she was different and daring, and those are the aspects that were starting to come out in Dre. I never seen two people fall in love so fast, so quick. Eric and Dre grew really close, and the next thing you know, wham, Eric is pregnant. November the 18th, 1997, i never forget it. I got a call and says, Andre needs to get to Dallas, Texas, because his son, Seven Sirius Benjamin, was being born. The birth of Seven was another catalyst in Dre's life. It propelled him further into becoming serious about who he was. At the time, Big and Dre, they weren't spending a lot of time with each other. They were getting a little older, and, you know, they were into different things. Dre was so non-party going, and Big Boy was always headed to the party. They had separate tour buses, a smoking bus, then they had a non-smoking bus. And the non-smoking bus was Dre's bus. It was like a just calm, mellowed out bus. Big couldn't believe that Dre was not smoking anymore, and that, you know, he was just changing like he was. It's just kind of... Unexpected for your friend that you've been friends with for so long, you know, start making those changes. The men in them started to come out, and they were growing in separate ways. It seemed like they were moving in different roads. From the outside, people were looking at it like, how is this going to work? During the Aliens, Dre and Big, their differences started to come out, and a lot of people were wondering how this was going to work. Big Boy was definitely like the player that you would see, you know, out in the clubs, wearing hats, jeans, sneakers, that sort of thing. And Dre was like, you know what? I feel like being different and free. Dre, at that point, was unafraid to do anything. You know, he was past the turban. He was kind of going into, like, monkey fur pants. Dre is wearing ski boots. <laughs> ski boots with platinum wigs. He may come out of fur coat and underwear. He always said, I want to look like the music. The music is beautiful and colorful. And I want to look like that. People were saying Dre was crazy. I mean, bottom line, people say that Dre lost his mind. People were asking Big Boy, like, is Dre gay? 
when he was getting flack from the stuff that he wore, Antoine always, you know, was right there by his side. Big Boy always had a lot of respect for Dre. Both of them were always on the same page in terms of the goals that Outkast, the group, was trying to achieve. The love of the music always brought them back together, regardless of what they were doing, separately. In the later part of 1997, Outkast entered the studio to record the Equimini album. Equimini is like the, the pivotal point for them. It's the place where they raise their flags the individual flags about who they are. During the Quimini, Big Boy became that great MC. Many a day has passed, the night has gone by, but still I find the time to put that bump off in your eye. And Andre became a great producer. Dre always continually wanted to, you know, evolve musically and do different stuff. He wanted to be able to play a lot of the instruments himself. Dre's passion to do different kinds of music took him a little to the left. Big Boy found his balance in that if Dre was going to do weirder sounding music, I got to make sure I do clear street hooks and make sure my verses are going to be for the people that we started with. They definitely understood their roles, and they also understood how important the balance was, which is why they ended up coming up with the name of Quimini. It's him and I, or Quimini. The Quimini stands for Aquarius and Gemini. So they took both of their signs and put it together, which showed their individuality coming together as one. It's amazing that when you have two people who are that different, that when they come together in the music, it seems like it just always blends. The Aquemini album was released September 29, 1998. Aquemini got five mics from the Source magazine. In the hip-hop world, that's like a seal of approval. Aquemini was received creatively by a lot of people as a classic record. While everything was going great on the professional side, at home there was drama. Dre was just ending a real serious relationship. The relationship with Erica sort of grew and fizzled. Erica was more like a mother to Dre instead of, you know, a girlfriend or a companion. I think he felt remorseful, and it was a painful experience for both of them. Big also was going through some things with him and his baby mom. Antoine had his first child, Jordan, with Shalita. And then a few years later, you know, another young lady was pregnant. He had a lot of baby mama drama being that he had two baby mamas at the same time. Big and Dre were going through very similar problems, and I think they both just needed to get back in the studio and put it all on the record. In the fall of 1999, Outkast went in the studio to record the Stank Only album. Yeah, this one right here goes out to all the babies, mamas, mamas. Miss Jackson was a song that both Antoine and Dre came up with as an allegory for their lives. Miss Jackson was talking to the parents of the females in their lives. Just letting them know that I'm sorry if I can't be there when you want me to be, but I'm trying my best. Maybe I've done wrong in the past, but I am here. I'm being a father, you know basically get off my back. One, two, three, yeah! Think Only was a true experiment. They went in, like, William Shatner land, and, like, this uncharted territory. From the So Fresh, So Clean to the bombs over Baghdad. It just went from one extreme to the next. They were like, OK, we've done a pretty good job in terms of our acceptance in the hip hop world. Now let's just, you know, challenge rap overall. Right. <laughs> In the fall of 2000, Outkast released their fourth album, Stankonia, and Miss Jackson shot to the top of the charts. It was like magic. Once people heard this record, it just caught on like wildfire. It went to the top of the radio charts, to the top of the video charts. It was like nothing we'd ever seen before. An uh, old white woman I worked with was like singing Miss Jackson. And I was like, <laughs> like, you know that song? Stankonia opened the guys up to new audiences, mainstream people started to realize that Outkast was special. Like, we knew these guys had, like, totally arrived. The coolest motherfuckers on the planet. After Stank Only was released, the Grammy nominations came out, and the guys found themselves nominated for Best Rap Album and Best Rap Performance from Ms. Jackson. Right. And the Grammy goes to... And the Grammy goes to... Outkast, Ms. Jackson. Stankonia, Outkast! <laughs> It was such a big moment for them. 
They really felt like all the hard work over the years had really paid off. It provided the validation that different can be good. Breaking the boundaries can be good. And it's so amazing that now Outkast is mainstream, you know, and has mainstream acceptance because they've always really been Outkast. They were always very different. I think creatively, they always wanted to push themselves. They didn't want to sound the same on every album, and they didn't want to sound like anyone else out there. For Big Boy and Dre, there was a sense of success and achievement, but not a sense of complacency. For them, it was now, how do we win album of the year? Speaker box, the love below. The Grammys this past year, Outkast won Album of the Year, which obviously is the most important award of the night. It all finally came together this night at the Grammys. I mean, they win the most prestigious award of the night. Outkast is forever changing, forever inventing themselves. Whatever that line is that we say you can't go past or you can't do, Outkast is trying to push that. Big and Drake have already seen what rap has done before. They want to see what rap can do. They are leaving a legacy. Outcast is everlasting. Forever, ever. ever.